Hey, this is Alex East, and I would like to continue the random and interesting series here with a little bit of a sidestep. I want to get back to probability theory because that's what I'm kind of into right now based on what I'm working on scientifically. But before I do that, I would like to just do a little bit of a detour here and talk about the Schwartz space because when talking about distributions and probability theory, it it sometimes helps to know a little bit about the Schwartz space. And I found some of these proofs that I'm going to show a really nice and simple exercise, but yet, you know, you, that yields a powerful tool to kind of deal with certain situations. And we'll see that later on when I think I want to talk about the characteristic function. So we'll utilize that over there, but also the Schwartz space the continuous dual of the Schwartz space is the space of generalized functions, i.e. distributions, which comes in handy in other areas of mathematics, like when you're talking about weak solutions of partial differential equations. So this, this is like kind of a universal, this content is universal across a lot of different, or the utility of this content is universal across a lot of different areas of mathematics. That's what I want to say. So what we're going to look at now is I just want to define. So let's talk about the Schwartz space. Okay, so what is the Schwartz space? So we define the Schwartz space as the space of functions. Um, functions from we're going to just do from R to C, but this R could be replaced with Rn, where N, N is from, not R, but N is from N, not N0, but N. Uh, but we're going to just do this, this case right here. Then we demand that F are if infinitely differentiable on R. And lastly, we we demand this type of thing, the supremum x over r, we'll put an alpha, and here we'll put a beta. This is finite for all alpha, beta. Now here, this is basically the system of, this corresponds to the system of system of semi norms generating the topology and maybe someday we'll talk about the topology on the short space but at this point i want to avoid that because that's a rather involved discussion and really it's it's a long discussion that just gives you at the end of the day it gives you just a couple of criteria that you can lean upon when talking about convergence in the Schwartz space and all that. So it's a long discussion that's theoretically very interesting, but it, in the end, it just gives you one statement with a couple of sub-statements that tell you how you should deal with convergence in the Schwartz space. But we're not going to talk about convergence, so we're going to put topology to the side for the moment. And we're going to talk about, let me just make a little note here. Um, a little note on what I want to look into this occurred to me. And let's just talk about some of the simple properties that one can readily see. So you, you label, label the short space. SS, okay, I don't want to do that. Schwartz space, label it SR, okay? Then SR is a linear space. Okay, so we want to look into this real quick. So consider F and G from the Schwartz space and consider consider alpha a real number. Now I'm thinking if it should be real or complex. I think what it can be actually is, is complex. I think it's a, 
it's a complex vector space. It won't matter. So what we're going to do is alpha f plus g, and we're going to try to evaluate. And of course, see that they're, all these are from r to c. Adding these two and multiplying f by alpha is from r to c still. Um, f, they're infinitely differentiable. Because if we different different when you differentiate it, the differentiation is linear. That's what I want to say. And now we just got to check the norm right here. So what we get is this to beta x. I'm gonna write it without the supremum x alpha. So we have to look at this type of expression. So from the linearity of linearity of um, the derivative. And the triangle inequality, we immediately get triangle inequality in C. We immediately get this type of thing, alpha um, f beta x plus g beta x. And now if we take the supremum, over all x in R, we of course get the following thing, supreme R x alpha, just have to copy this guy right here, alpha f plus g. Here we're of course using the pointwise definition of the addition of two functions. And um, here, Yeah, here it kind of, we'll write it like this. Supremum x of r, so that you can see what's going on exactly. F beta x, supremum x r. So this is a rather simple calculation that gives us plus infinity, okay? Uh, yeah, so th this is this is, of course, true because this this thing right here is true because f and g were both in the Schwartz space. Now, next, what I want to do is so that was re relatively simple, but it's good to know it's a linear space. These simple properties and come in handy when you're dealing with certain functions, or functions from the Schwartz space. So what, what else did I want to prove? I wanted to prove that this is an interesting one. SR is closed with respect to polynomial multiplication. So let's assume, let's take PX. Okay. It's, this will be from R to C poly of degree p, okay? And now what we want to do is we want to show that if we take a function from the short space, that still p times f is from the short space, okay? And <clears throat> we'll show this as follows. I'll put a little proof because this is going to actually be a little little proof. So we choose an alpha. So first we'll focus on alpha it's from n, zero, well, yeah, n zero and beta is zero, okay? We'll focus on, should we focus on this? No, I think, I think we just, we can just do like this. And then we wanna look at same, you know, same technique as last time. We want to look at this expression right here. F beta x, okay, like this. From this, what we get, we use the Leibniz rule for differentiation. And what we get here is, I'll leave the absolute value on the outside for now. K goes from zero to beta, and here we get beta k, and then P x to kth power f 
beta minus k x. Okay, this is the Leibniz rule. Now, what we can do here is, <clears throat> what can we do? We can just do like this. And we can, of course, use the triangle inequality to move the absolute value in C inwards, okay? Px, k, okay. derivative, and then here f, b minus k, x. So that's what we've done. And now, I'm thinking whether I should put it in, yeah, we gotta have a look at this through the following lens. So we want to take the supremum over all x, r. So what we want to do is supremum all x, r. I'm going to call this just for, this is going to be my capital F, x, okay, independent alpha, beta. So supremum, capital F, alpha, beta, x. And now look at this. Since this thing right here inside, regardless of what beta or alpha are, this is continuous on R. So we can look at this as, so on any closed interval, on any compact interval, namely, say minus one, one, it will have, have, um, have a maximum. So what we're going to do is we're going to go max and there's going to be C here. And this C right here will be defined as the supremum over X minus one, one of say this F alpha beta X. Okay. This expression in here, since it's continuous, it's going to and then all I have to do is take the supremum over x, r minus, let's say, minus 1, 1, okay, of f alpha beta x. And so I'm interested in this guy. So now I'm going to use my expression right here to work with that. And the first thing that I'll notice is that on why I did this, this is the following reason. On minus infinity, minus one, say closed, union with one plus infinity, there exists, or so, yeah, there exists, <laughs> wait, um, for any poly, of degree Q, there exists a C, let's say poly Q, there exists a C such that it's Q of X, absolute value is smaller or equal C, and here we just put X to the Q, okay? So that's, that's really important. In fact, I could even remove, remove this, this absolute value by, but we can keep it there because it doesn't really bother us. Um, and by choosing um, uh, an even exponent. And this will make our life a lot easier. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at this. I'm going to label this, this guy. Let me just use purple. Label this guy, Roman numeral one. And... I'm going to work on this guy, Roman numeral one. Basically, I can shove the supremum within here. And you can also verify that, that that's true, that supremum can travel in here while increasing potentially the, yeah, you get me. Uh, so I can just do beta k, and in here, I'm going to also estimate the polynomial, because this polynomial right here is 
at most of degree of degree p. Okay, so for each of those polynomials, so I can say that there is just a c dependent on the derivative here, so k, and then I just put the maximum degree x what was the degree p did i did i label it p yes i did label it p and then we get f k x okay but there's a p plus alpha actually i forgot about the alpha and then just by taking just take the maximum now we'll just take these guys right here and label Label M will be the maximum over all K zero to beta of this whole thing, beta K times CK, okay? And that'll give me the following. That'll give, I can just estimate any one of these with the, with the maximum value, and that'll give me this, K equals zero. Oh, sorry, I forgot about the supremum in here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sneak it in here. The supremum goes over here, okay? So I'm going to k equals 0 um, to beta supremum over x minus 1, okay? So what you get here is this guy right here. But then this supremum x over r... This constant m can travel in front. And then we get x, p plus alpha, f, beta minus k, x, like that. But we already know. <laughs> I put infinity here, which of course is nonsense, right? There should be a beta here. But we already know that since f is from the short space, this must be finite because there's finitely many terms, each of which needs to be finite. And there's a constant multiplying in and they're summed, but that doesn't matter. Each of them needs to, all of them need to be finite. So we've proven that, that, um, so this is finite and this C right here, we've already talked about, that's finite as well. So at the end of the day, this whole thing, is finite. So we've proven that that you can multiply an element of the short space by a polynomial and still stay in the short space. So that's another thing that I'm not going to prove that is very easy to prove as well is um, that f lies in, we'll put it here. This is, I'm going to make a little square here. This is custom. F lies in the Schwartz space, implies F nth derivative lies in the Schwartz space. Okay, you can prove that, that it's closed with respect to differentiation. That's relatively straightforward as well. In fact, it, it follows from the, directly from the definition. So what we get, so now what shall we do next? I made myself a little bit of a list, so short space is linear with respect to polynomial multiplication. Another general property that one can prove is the following. The following inclusion, which, which comes in handy. So basically, it the inclusion is this. SR is a subset of LPR for all P from N0. So basically, you take a function from the short space, and it must be integrable. So now the question is, how do we how do we prove this? So we're going to just do a little proof. So all these proofs are relatively short, and they're relatively easy. There's just like a couple of technicalities that you need to do. But it's nice to go through them to kind of get a feel for the functions that are in the short space. So what we're going to do is we're going to use we're going to try to find out. So f is from the short space. And that should imply that 
the integral over r f x p d, d yeah where this this measure right here is um is um the lebeg measure and p is from n0 oh yeah so we'd like to we'd like to prove this so what we do is well, we just look at that integral and again we'll use the same trick as we did before, we're gonna, I'm gonna just use dx, okay? A little bit of measure, let's dx over here. So we're gonna separate this, minus one, one, f, x. We're gonna actually make it, oh, we know that, no, we know we, that zero measure, so we can, we can just do it like this, plus r minus, minus one. We're just gonna make it, just because we want to, minus one, one. Make them both like closed. Because we know that we can add a singleton and not change the outcome of the integral. Now again, this guy over here is, is C minus one, one. Implies that there exists an M dependent on P such that um, it estimates the function. And so, so this guy, of course, is, this guy's just two times MP, okay? And then we leave this guy here for now, for the moment. Okay, FX DX. So now we're only interested in this this guy right here. I'm gonna mark him Roman numeral two, and I'm gonna work on this guy over here. And this one over here, we're just gonna use the finiteness of the Schwartz space norm, or the semi-norms in the Schwartz space, better said. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just write this integral in the following way where fx stays here, but I'm gonna multiply by xn, and put it all in a, like this, and then down here, in order to maintain equality, I'm gonna put x, uh, the absolute value of x to np. Well, what that does is, I, I now know, because the supremum, supremum, because F is an element of the Schwartz space, so the supremum of x to the nth power fx is finite. So I can just, just put that guy over here and x n, where n is an arbitrary natural number, okay? n is from n right now. So I have a little bit of, like I can choose what n is, and then the whole thing was p, and then in here I get one over x and p dx, and then this whole thing is of course finite because what do I have here? This guy is finite by definition, and then you take it to the p, and you still get a finite number. Over here, this guy, p is given, Sorry, I, I said n0, but it's supposed to be n. There's supposed to be n here, okay? So if it's 1, so yeah, you can always set p and then set n, set n, so that this guy converges, which is always possible. Which is always possible. So this guy is finite. And this guy, as we've already established, is finite as well. So in fact, a function from the Schwartz space is immediately LP integrable, regardless of the P. Now it's also, you can set P as infinity and work with the essential supremum, but that, that's, that's valid too. I'll leave that as an exercise, but so, but here we've only proven it for natural, natural P's. 
Okay, so what's the last thing I wanted to show? Oh yeah, the last thing I wanted to, wanted to show was, it's like a useful thing, useful, useful. So all of these were theoretical properties of the short space, but now we're gonna be interested in whether this guy belongs to the short space for A from R plus. So there was A is greater than zero. So what we're gonna do here is, this is actually quite a nice little proof because it involves, you get to use Taylor series in a pr pretty standard way, but it's I think it's a nice way to look at Taylor series. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at A, X and, and expand it using Taylor series. I could write an infinite sum, but just for illustration, I'm going to not do that and I'm gonna write it in, I'm gonna make this smaller right here. The first one, it's just a one. Then there's an AX squared divided by one. Then there's an A squared X to the fourth power divided by two plus da 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 da. And then they'll, over here there's A and x to n and down here there's n factorial plus and it goes on now let's notice so we're actually interested in okay so now all these are positive notice positive okay so what we can definitely take from this is that we're coming to the bottom from this we can we can sorry we can pick out any like we can concatenate this series and we will have a lower estimate of a uh, e to the a x squared what we're going to do is we're going to pick out this is this is the part that i really like we're going to do this we're going to pick out a different term actually we don't even need this one we're going to pick out a different term so this is gonna be the term for all n from n. You can do this because this is an infinite series with all positive terms that converge to the a, e to the ax squared. And you're just picking out one single positive term right here. Now we can flip this to get a relationship with what we actually are interested in. Okay, the, interest, the important thing to note here is that you can choose your n later. That's the flexibility that we're given here. And now we would like to see, now, now comes the, the important part. And that's, so if you look at your function, okay? What we really wanna know is how it behaves in plus or minus infinity, because if it goes to zero and minus, if you send the limit of this, this guy to minus infinity or plus infinity, after you've multiplied it by a polynomial. So that's the thing that I have to actually write. So we're gonna be trying to show, show that the supremum x alpha e minus ax. So we're looking at the Schwartz space norm is, is finite. We're looking at this in particular. And what really, determines whether this is going to be finite or infinite is the behavior of the function at plus infinity. Why? Plus and minus infinity. Why? Because look at this. We, if, if this function, if x alpha e minus ax squared goes to zero as x plus minus infinity, and what does that mean? That means that I could, I know that for all that I can choose, choose epsilon one, then you'll find a minus alpha alpha such that, such that this, this guy right here, x alpha, X the alpha minus x squared, absolute value, absolute value, but that doesn't matter because it's a positive function, of course, such that this guy is smaller 
then one for all x absolute value greater than alpha. Now that, and in here, so this function is bounded outside in these regions, this region right here, and this region right here by one, obviously, like this. But in here, it's a continuous function on a compact set. So it's, it's, it has a supremum, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so I can estimate it there. So what my whole thing is reduced to is whether, whether like finding out what the behavior is with respect to the limit to plus or minus infinity, plus and minus infinity. Well, this function is symmetric, symmetrical, right? So we actually only have to look at x greater than zero and x alpha e. Look at this expression and send x to plus infinity because of symmetry. Well, what happens here? This thing is positive. Now, my guy up here gives me an estimate for all. This important thing here is that this is for all n from n, this estimate. Well, what does this mean? That means that I can set for n, in particular, n equals alpha. Oh, sorry, I did not flip these. That's, I'm just looking at this, why, why is it so weird? But I forgot to flip this, which is a key thing. Okay, and then this guy, of course, these two go against each other. And, and my apologies, well, everyone makes mistakes, obviously. So you get this, and now if you set n equal to alpha, you'll get n factorial a to the nth power, and then over here you get x to the nth power which obviously goes to zero as x goes to plus infinity. So what we've gotten is, out of all of this, is that x alpha e minus ax squared goes to zero as x goes to plus minus infinity symmetry. And this argument right here then gave us, gives us that that is, in fact, enough to conclude that this is true right here. Now, the interesting, that, interesting thing that I'd like to pull your attention to here is that you often hear about, you know, the exponential grows faster than any polynomial. And you often hear that if you put a minus in front of the exponent in the exponential, it will decay faster than any polynomial. Well, that's exactly what's encoded in the, the series right here. And that's exactly what I used. But I basically got to like kind of a rigorous formulation for that type of thing, which is really nice. So that's what I, that's the main takeaway from the technique in this proof that you can like use the Taylor series to actually, you know, give yourself that proper rigorous leverage on you know, showing that the exponential grows faster than any polynomial, as we've shown here. Now, I'm going to say that this is done. Some of you might object that, um, you know, I've only really done alpha is from n. Ah, alpha is from n, zero, but I didn't do beta. I didn't do beta from n, n, zero. But... It's sufficient to realize that taking the derivative of this type of function always results in that function times x to some exponent. Okay, like just taking the derivative of, of d dx of e minus ax squared. So that always results in, you know, in terms of this form anyway. So you could you could manually do that or just just call it a day. And so that's just one thing. If you want to do that as an exercise, feel free to do so. 
but this is this is actually enough to show that this guy is an SR. And now I just want to have a little bit of a, you know, I just want to give you like how all of this can be useful. Like an example would be the following. Okay, how is this useful? How is this? Well, of course, in many ways, but like I found like a very rudimentary situation would be you're dealing with some e to the whatever minus ax squared divided by b or you even have like uh, some kind of Gaussian distribution here going on in your calculations in probability theory. You have something like this. How does this go? Square, I guess. Maybe there's a two here, whatever. You have something like this. You have your integral. And then all of a sudden, you're dealing with moments of this function. It's multiplied by x squared. Okay. Or a different, like this. And you'd like to know, okay, is this is this finite? And if you know about you know these basic properties of a short space, you're good because you know that this guy, this guy must be in the short space. And you also know that if you multiply the short space is closed with respect to multiplication. So this guy is in the short space. So you multiply a polynomial, this function by a polynomial, you're still in the short space. And last but not least, you know that the short space is a subset of LP R. So in particular, it's a subset of, for P equals one, Lebesgue integrable functions. So you can Lebesgue, the, you can Lebesgue, you can Lebesgue, integrate this guy yeah so that's that's all i'm saying okay so like all this theory is nice but you better know how to use it when it comes down to it so any like my takeaway from all this is any theoretical knowledge that you acquire about certain functional spaces or whatever um try to use it when you're actually dealing with calculations and, you know, in your everyday, quote unquote, life in, in science or whatever you're doing, some statistical analysis. And so if you run across things, you can immediately, knowing the structure of some of these, like I'm going to do LP spaces. I'm going to probably do, at some point, I'm going to look into... Uh, What's that called? Sibilev spaces and stuff like that. But for now, I'll leave you with this.